Hello there, and welcome back to Daddy Roll the One. I'm Martin, and this is another video in my series on the four tabletop role playing game books that I would want with me to run all of my future campaigns under the assumption that I could never get another role playing game book to help me. So, kind of my desert island books, if you will. In part two, specifically, I went over my criteria of why I picked the books I did. Here's a list here, but in part two, I go into much more detail and provide context. So I'd encourage you to watch that if you want to understand sort of what, how I got to this list. So in part one, I covered the Tome of Adventure Design. Part two was Knock Magazine. And then today, part three, we're going to be going over this book. However, my third choice, I did say I would pick either this book or a different book, which would be this one, The Folklore Bestiary by Mary Mushman. They're two very, very different kinds of books. So I will be doing a follow-up video to this, kind of like part three and a half, I guess, if you will. But today for part three, we are talking about this book. This is Veins of the Earth, published by Lamentations of the Flame Princess, which is the name of the publisher, but it's also name of a game that they publish that is a uh, a lot of people will call it a retro clone. It is a old school style game that is done in the style of the 1981 Moldvay basic D&D game that I actually run right now for my daughter. If you're not familiar with that game, you'll want to watch my video on the history of D&D editions. There's a link here in the upper right hand corner. So this book here is by Patrick Stewart. You see Stewart with a U, not with an EW, and the art is done by Scrap Princess. So these two have done a lot of things in the RPG industry, um, sometimes together, sometimes apart. Together, uh, they were most probably most well known for Deep Carbon Observatory, um, as well as this book. So if you see here, what it talks about is the endless descent at the deepest point of the dungeon behind the throne, beyond the rooms where the battles took place. After everything is done and the enemy dead, there was a crack a black empty space where the wall joins the stone floor a foot and a half high and three wide. A breeze comes out. You'd never noticed it. You could lie on your belly and fit inside. And then if you go in, it talks about how it never ends. And it gets further into this and it talks about the idea is that you're exploring the veins of the earth. So in, this, in essence, what this is, is a version of underground adventuring, sort of the underdark of the Forgotten Realms, however, where that one is much more of a high fantasy, sort of like these, these grand, very friendly cultures, maybe not so friendly, but they're not they're not alien. They're they're very similar to the cultures that you would encounter above ground. They just happen to be underground. This book is about making the underground environment alien and dark and oppressive and gloomy. And I use this very specifically to help run the game that I run for my 13 year old daughter and her friends. And I'll be talking about that a little bit as we go through this book and how I use it. Uh, they started playing about two years ago and or almost three now coming up on it, about two and a half. And uh, I use this a lot because I wanted to evoke the style of game that I started playing when I was a kid, which is that player characters I wanted them to be adventurers. They don't start out being heroes. They become heroes, maybe, but they're adventurers, which means they have to deal with challenges. And this book is about challenges of being underground and what that means. It means that you need to make sure that you're prepared accordingly and appropriately. You need to have torches and food, you know, rations. You need to maybe know, have a guide, be able to get where you're going. And that is a kind of game where you're playing against this and your character has to be smart and clever in order to, to survive these challenges of being underground, as opposed to just treating it as just, you know, another, another place where they're going to go loot and explore and kill the bad guy and take his treasure, right? That's not what this is. This is about almost, it's, it's about exploring the environment and what that means. So I'm running my daughter and her friends through the 19, uh, 1979, I think 78, 79 adventure by Gary Gygax called Keep on the Borderlands. And in that um, adventure, there's this section called the Caves of Chaos. And there's different, uh, you know, creatures that live in there, goblins and orcs and kobolds and things like that. And I've changed quite a few of those. But the idea is that Gary never actually explains what it really would be like to your sensory perception to be exploring caves underground. He never gets into that. That's what this book helps with. So let's dive in and look and see what we're getting in here. So this is, it's roughly 360 pages. Uh, it's, as you saw, it's very thick and the paper itself is very thick. So um, Lamentations of the Flame Princess is really known for their production design. And this is very clearly one of those great examples. You've got your tables here on the front 
and, and uh, back inside covers. And what I love about this is, so, so let's look at these tables here. You've got D50 cave shapes, D50 kinds of stone, and then D50 smells and sounds right here. Now these tables are back in here as well, but as a DM using it at the table, I don't want to flip through a book, but if they enter a cave system that I wasn't preparing, I've got this right here. Bam. I can talk about what the smells are that I couldn't necessarily come up with off the tip of my head, but I have this list here that I can use the kinds of stone ways of describing these caves so that they are different. And it's not just, you know, it's cold rock and it's dark. It's this gets much more specific. So I love that using the smells and sounds. So an example of the way that I use this book is uh, for the cave system in the Caves of Chaos. What I've done in my DM notebook is I printed out, um, you know, a two page spread for each cave system. And then each specific cave within those larger systems, I describe it based on the, the smell and the sound because in my daughter's game, there's no dark vision. So characters don't have dark vision in basic D&D Elves and dwarves have something called infravision, which is kind of like a limited form of heat vision based on, you know, body temperature and things like that. We don't even use that. I just said, nope, we're not using that. So they have to have torches. They have to keep track of, um, you know, how are they going to get a light source if their torch goes out? And, you know, how are they going to fumble around in their backpack in the dark and try to find, find flint and steel to light a torch if their torch went out and they weren't handling it appropriately? And so... Each one of these caves I describe based on the smell and the sound. And so when they're exploring, a lot of times that's how they're identifying where they are. They're not looking at a map because it's too dark. They can't see a map even if they were underground and had one. So they're relying on their other senses. And so I'll say, oh, you smell, you know, this chemical smell. And they'll know oh, like, oh, we're back at the alchemist lab. And, and so they know where they are and then they can maneuver from there. So that's how I use a book like this. And um, it's become really evocative in that game. It's really helped them use their imagination. And speaking of imagination, the art in this book by Scrap Princess, something I really, really like. One of the reasons I like about this is, is because, and I, I mean this to be a compliment, it is a suggestion of a thing that my mind is then going to fill in based on my own personal experiences and histories of maybe nightmares I had as a kid or whatever it was. And it's going to be much scarier than if this were a hyper-realistic, detailed full color painting like we see in most modern role playing games, because that's based on what the creator thought it looked like. But what I think it looks like is going to, again, based on my experiences, is going to be much scarier. So I liken it to the difference between uh, a horror movie that is a suspense horror movie and a horror movie that's a gore horror movie. So gore doesn't really necessarily scare a lot of people because it's just you see it right there and you know it's fake and it's and it's it's not real but suspense when you don't see the gore your brain is filling that in with what you think might be happening and it's way scarier at least to me and that's the type of stuff that i use in my daughter's game to help evoke those those sensations with the players and they love it they get scared and they'll they'll scream and things like that just based on a description not a picture and that's what this kind of art does for me all right. So really quick, it just gets into the underworld and like what that means. This book is broken into a few different sections. So prize of the earth are your monsters. OK, so it's got all these new monsters. It's got cultures. It's got a section on light and dark and how to do that uh, for an underground campaign. Encumbrance exploration, climbing travel and then generating cave uh, in a, th you know, doing a three dimensional space on a two dimensional piece of paper and how to draw that to make it work. Uh, items, treasures and spells and uh, madness and change, and then appendices, appendices. Okay, so the first part again is, is these monsters. It goes into these stat blocks. Now again, this game is, this book is created for um, Lamentations of the Flame Princess, which is an old school style of game. But if you're a 5e player, please don't be put off by that. So I can't tell you how many books I ignored in my 3e days. Well, I started way back in the 80s. But when third edition came out, I was fixated on only wanting to look at books and supplements that had 3e stats in them because I really thought that I needed it. And I ignored a lot of really good material. And I can tell you how sorry I am now that I did that, especially as I've gotten older and I've realized how easy it is to convert these things. So the way they do the stats boxes, they tell you what the armor is for this creature. Instead of giving you an AC, they tell you it's the equivalent of a human wearing plate plus shield, as an example. If you're a 5e player, you know what that means. 
you know how to calculate plate plus shield as an AC, and that's the AC of this monster. We all know what hit dice are. We know what hit points are, moves, damage, you know, all these different things. Um, it gives you a morale score. It tells you how to how to calculate morale here. I'll tell you right now, there is morale in 5e. It's in the Dungeon Master's Guide in the back. It's not done the same way as here. It's based on a d20 check. This is based on a 2d6. However, if you read this paragraph here, you'll have all the info you need in order to convert this and do it as, as a d20 check. The math's not going to work out exactly the same, but that's not the point. It's going to be close enough, and it's going to give you this, the feeling of having a morale check. Okay? So... Please don't be put off by the fact that this wasn't made for 5e. Give it a chance and see how much in here is really applicable to any edition of the game that you're playing. So it goes in these monsters, and one that I just kind of want to uh, highlight really quickly is this one back here called Panic Attack Jack. So there's some art for you there. So Panic Attack Jack, it gives you your stats. We talked about that, but it tells you what does it smell like? And what are the sounds that you're going to hear? Okay. And then what is it? It's the body of a caver of some sighted civilized humanoid race. They're dead and often wrapped in ropes that broke their neck. The limbs are all splintered from falls. The spine is bent. The wet ropes trail behind them like a veil. The pack is still unopened on their back. This is so creepy. And it's just so much different than the kinds of creatures that you see in most other, you know, modern role playing games where they're, you know, it's more family friendly and that's fine. This is totally, and there's, there's a place for that. If my daughter was much younger, I would not want to use something like this. This would just freak her out and she'd have nightmares for weeks. However, she's a little bit older now. She's a teen and um, she's starting to appreciate this kind of stuff. Now, I sometimes tone it down a little bit for things like this, but this just gives me ideas on how to convey and, uh, something that I wouldn't have thought of on my own. And it's just so much different than just having like a tribe of orcs or something. So you've got, this is a terrible thing to face. The shattered bodies of a handful of climbers down, uh, drown and tied in bundles by wet rope, a clump of broken backs and bent back, back bent fingers walking on cracked limbs, a dozen begging voices wrapped up by equipment, dead lights dragging and bouncing behind it, crawling towards you like a pale massacre pile. Again, so creepy. And, and, and just something that you wouldn't want to encounter in, in a cave system. And then, you know, what would you do? But also treasure tons of climbing equipment. So if that's something that you need, you might have to fight these things and try to get that. Okay, so there's just more creatures in here. Again, you saw that list earlier. But then it gets into your cultures. So there's 12 of them. So you've got the Alpha Doll. This is like their version of Dark Elves, but much more alien much more sinister and creepy and the culture is just you know it's it's much different than what we're used to uh and i kind of like it they're not just elves that live underground they're much much different so you've got all these different cultures again in here and then it gets to this section on light and dark now one of the things i really liked about this is very innovative for this book is the idea that your currency when you're underground is not gold gold's not important what's important is light so everything that you need to do underground your movement your exploration finding food, all that kind of stuff is based on how much light you have. And then how much are you using to do this thing that you need to do? You've got combat, you need to see, you've got your torches out or your lanterns, you're expending fuel during that combat. And then that's going to count against you later on when you need that for something else. So a lot of this is tracking that stuff. I know a lot of people don't like tracking that. They think it's boring. It's in this setting, it's not boring. It's part of what makes this fun. It's this idea of like, you know, making sure that you had enough torches and then where did that character go that had the torch? And maybe that character was your guide and your guide fell while climbing. And now that pack of torches is gone. And what are you going to do? Right. So that's part of this. Again, you're adventuring. You're not superheroes. So I also love um, using lamps as initiative. Very clever uh, mechanic. 20 different lamps. Such a fun idea. Uh, different fuels for each. And you've got all these illustrations, other rumored light sources. And then they have this series of checks when you're lost in the dark. Um, you you know make you make stat checks, right? And there's different um, consequences if you fail your different stat checks. What does that mean? And they use this same system for things like exploring and finding food and climbing. Similar idea. You've got a character sheet here with a very neat and very simple way of tracking encumbrance to make it easy for people that don't like to track that. 
It's a very uh, easy to use system. It can be used in any edition. So you've got exploring, you've got climbing, okay, and you know different types of climbing. And then you've got generating the veins. This is those maps where you're trying to convey a three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional piece of paper. And they talk about how to do that. It's very clever. And then you've got back here, I have this bookmark because I use this all the time, 100 caves. So this comes up a lot in my daughter's game where they'll go a cave system I wasn't planning for. And I can just find one of these caves and use it right, right off the bat. It's super easy to use. So that's basically this book. I mean, you know, there's you can see there's more in here. But... Um, you get the idea of using this book. I, I really like this book. It was one of the books that really um, helped me run the game that I run for my daughter. A couple things with this, though. Um, it is available on drive through RPG. You can find the PDF there. However, as far as a hard copy right now, it looks like it's sold out. So I did find a site that had a copy as recently as a month ago. So they do come through from time to time. I've seen it on eBay, but it's like hundreds of dollars. I wouldn't do that. Don't please don't do that. Um, you're just, you know, giving money to speculators. I would um, wait and see if it ever gets a reprint. Um, they, these guys do reprint stuff from time to time. This is a first printing and there is there is a second printing out there. So um, you can just check back from time to time. I got this just a few years ago and I paid basically cover price. So there's no reason to, to you know, again, pay hundreds of dollars for that. However, if you can't find this and you don't want a PDF and you want something like this, I could recommend this book. I'll have a link to this below where you can get this. This is Into the Weird and Wild. And it's the same idea. However, this is done for wilderness. Okay. But, it's, you know, it's got creatures, it's got cultures, it's got generating in the wilderness. Okay. Magic, all that kind of stuff. Same idea, different authors, different publisher, but it's the same kind of concept. And one of the things I like about this is they include this section on system neutral and what that means. So this is helping players convert between systems if you're more, if you're used to, um, you know, a five each style of game. Or conversely, if you're used to an old school style of the game, this, this book does use advantage and disadvantage. And so they tell you what that means in here. So that's Into the Weird and Wild. The same company also published this book into the Cess and Citadel. So same idea. However, this is for cities. Okay. So creatures, you know, generating streets and, and cities. Uh, you've got cultures, artifacts and spells, locations, all that kind of stuff is in here. So it's the same idea. Really fun art. Again, different author, different publisher, but it's the same kind of idea as Veins of the Earth just for cities. So you've got cities, you've got wilderness. I use this one a lot my daughter's game. This one's pretty new, so I haven't used it as much. Just I haven't had a chance yet. All right, and then lastly, you could go super old school. You could go all the way back to Advanced Dungeons and Dragons first edition. Uh, if you are not familiar with this book, you'll want to see my video on all 18 of the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons hardbacks, but this comes out late in the first edition era, Dungeoneer's Survival Guide. So same, very similar kind of concept. There's a player section here for um, an overview of the Underdark movement, swimming, climbing, jumping, using rope bridges, all that kind of stuff. Proficiencies, these are called non-weapon proficiencies. These are skills. You wanna see my video on skills, link here in the upper right-hand corner to talk about skills and non-weapon proficiencies in the history of D&D games. Uh, gets into some mass combat stuff underground, but you know, air supply, cave-ins, all that kind of stuff that we saw in Veins of the Earth, but again, done in a more family-friendly format because this scene you know, was uh, made for D&D. That was at the time really made more for kids. And then there's a DM section that comes a little bit farther in. And so this is, you know, the underground environment and creating, uh, you know, campaigns and cultures and all that kind of stuff. All right. So that is my look at veins of the earth and some, some other options here for you. If you enjoy this video, could you please like it? And particularly if you could subscribe, if you've seen my videos before, I, I know I get a lot more views than I have subscribers and I would really appreciate a subscription. You'll be alerted. Uh, if you hit the bell notifications so that you know when I have new videos coming out. And I would super appreciate your support with that. If you could also share it um, on your social media, uh, that helps me grow my channel. And then leave a comment. Let me know what you think about this book. Have you used this? Or do you have other recommendations for a book that you would uh, recommend instead? Uh, let me know. Uh, and if you would like to support me right now, you, the best way to do that is if you could just buy a little something in my shop. There's a link below, but I've got shirts, mugs, posters, all kinds of things with exclusive designs. So that's it for now. And I will talk to you next time. Thank you.